I find that I have um, covered so much that it gives me time, and I needed it, to insert a special lecture next to the end. So tonight's lecture, The Civil Rights Movement and the Dream Deferred, but the next lecture after the Thanksgiving holiday would really be a lecture on our search for history and our search for definition and how we as a people got lost for his, from history. Um, so next week I will really be talking about the black American search for his place in history. And when I talk about the black American search, I'm talking about the whole African search for their place in history. I have to open up the meeting to get some corrections of the misconceptions and how the misconceptions keep coming up in spite of all that we do. Because to a great extent, how we look at ourselves determine what we do about ourselves. And we still look at ourselves in the main through the eyes of our oppressor. The best possible example is that silly, stupid movie, Shaka Zulu. 99% factually in error. But in order to straighten it out, you would have to read books written on Zulu life by the Zulus themselves. Mazzoli Kamini's excellent work, Emperor Chaka the Great. And another work written by a uh, South African writer, Thomas Mofalo, Chaka and Historical Romance. So there are many books, maybe the best book written on the results of the Zulu Wars, is a book by J. Omar Cooper, one of the few white writers who written something pretty decent on him, called The Zulu Aftermath. Then, inasmuch as there are so many African students in the country who are of Zulu extraction, why not talk to one of them? There are so many Africans in the country who, who are Zulus who are teaching in our schools. Why not just sit down and ask them what did happen? There were Africans on both sides of that struggle. And what we have to take into consideration is that the greatest achievement of the Europeans was the conquest of the mind. The conquest of the mentality. And that there wasn't enough European soldiers in all the world to control places as big as India, Africa, and the South Pacific. So they had to make you believe that you deserve to be ruled over by other people because you could not do it for yourself. Now, once military colonialism was partly over, another form of media colonialism came into power, the television. That has done more harm than good. The television literally made the civil, the, made the civil rights movement, accentuated, then slowly destroyed it and demeaned it. Now in the whole poll for president, when they mentioned the line of people that you're voting for who are eligible, 
why they never identify the others. They identify all of them by name until they get to Jesse Jackson. Then they emphasize that he was a civil rights activist. This is a cold word. Black radicals don't vote for him. Part of the media conquest of the mind. Part of the media conquest of the mind is also unreal fantasies like different strokes and Webster. <laughs> now you know in real life nothing like that. Nothing like that happens. They're not that good. <laughs> And because we have lost a feeling for what the mind can achieve, we missed our place in history because the, it was through the conquest of the mind that they convinced us that we were a minority. A minority convinced us that we were a minority. And we're one of the most dispersed people on the face of the earth. There are very few places on this earth where you won't find one of us. Then there's very few of us that don't long for one of us. It's a feeling when you're isolated with the other people for a long time. The feeling just to look at the face of one of your own becomes so overwhelming. <laughs> Langston Hughes describes this need for cultural kinship. In his book, I Wonder As I Wonder, he was going to China, he was on a boat with Europeans for about three months. I haven't seen a brother no place. He even, couldn't even see the cook. <laughs> so he got to China, still didn't see one. And uh, finally he's going to his hotel, he got a rickshaw, and passed a rickshaw with a brother. And he said, hi. The brother said, hi. <laughs> he never saw the brother again. <laughs> but like this, <laughs> He felt good the rest of his trip. <laughs> good for the soul. And what we don't understand is that through the conquest of the mind and through the media, we've been told to avoid each other. Well, that's the only special kind of soul medicine we can have is the meeting and the friendship one to the other. And if we ever united this and said that I won't buy a shirt except I buy it from you, I won't buy any shoes until I buy it from one of your shops, we could revolutionize our economy overnight. <laughs> All this means is the restoration of confidence, confidence in ourselves, and the seller of the shirt also had to have some responsibility to make sure that if he's selling to a brother or sister, he will sell a comparable, a good piece of good so that the brother and the sister could come back and recommend other brothers and sisters to come back and keep him in business. The business is a form of catering. So there's some certain things we have to learn again about ourselves. Now if one of us opened a store in China, I doubt if we'd get one customer. Open a store in India, I doubt if you could get one customer. In Korea, I doubt if you could get one customer. Same thing in Arabia. Then why? of Koreans, Chinese, Vietnamese, and East Indians 
running stores in your community and making profit. And why not you? And the main thing.